Hi, Steve Harvey with The Drill. We're here with the great Joe Torrey. Joe, tell us about Safe at Home. Well, uh, Steve, you know, Safe at Home, uh, I grew up in an abusive household. My dad abused my mom. I, he never physically abused me. He created a lot of fear in the house, and I was yeah. a nervous kid. And I never really associated, you know, the, the terror that he brought into the home with my feelings of insecurity, uh, low self-esteem, nervousness. Yeah. Uh, until I, I went through some, actually I went to a seminar in 1995 with my wife. Uh, she was eight months pregnant at the time. She said, you want to go to the symposium with me? And I said, sure. I was going to say yes to anything she asked me at that time, eight months pregnant. <laughs> right. and, and I found out uh, it was basically a self-help symposium. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so there was a speaker one day. Uh, it was about the second or third day into this four-day uh, symposium, and he struck a nerve with me mm -hmm. because I never talked a whole lot about it with Allie, my wife, and, and but I get up in front of perfect strangers and start crying my eyes out. Right. And, yeah. And so I, I felt at that point in time it freed me up to talk about it because now I wasn't born with these feelings they were created by what was going on in my home right and so we started safe at home and it was really Allie's uh, idea to do it through education mm -hmm. so what we do is we put uh, we put a master's level counselor in a safe room in the school yeah uh, we named the safe room after my mom Margaret's place nice. and it's it works. Yeah. What can I tell you? Uh, we let these kids know it's not their fault and they're not the only ones. Because yeah. I, I know if I had something like that, I needed somebody to talk to because I never shared it with anybody. Right. And any of my, uh, my friends, my buddies, you know, my dad's house, uh, car was in front of the house. I'd go to their house until uh, he left for work. And mm -hmm. So um, I, I've talked with people who, as you mentioned, sometimes people, it takes a while before they even know they're being abused mm -hmm. because this is normal to them, right? And, and there's so many different layers of abuse. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it could be controlling a checkbook. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my case, it was fear, even though he never, even though he didn't, he yelled a, a lot and scared me. Yes. Uh, he never physically, you know, uh, right. injured me in any way. I saw the the results of what he did to my mom, mm -hmm. and, and I heard when he didn't like uh, whatever she put on the table, throw mm -hmm. it against the wall. And I was in the room at it as an eight or nine year old when he went for his revolver because he was a, a New York City police uh, detective. Right. So, um, but you're right. I mean, there are so many uh, different layers of abuse. Yeah. And, um, it, um, it was frightening. I am, and of course, my mom and dad have since passed, and I never did have a chance to confront them or talk about it with them. Right. Well, it's great that you start something like this because we see so many things begin at this level where later we see the damage of someone who does something and you find out later that they were abused. Or, you, know. you know, unfortunately, when you see a lot of these uh, young people, you know, going to schools with guns and, and right. stuff, uh, there's a connection there somewhere for the yeah. most part. And, and that's why we're trying to, you know, uh, make an impression on these kids. Let these kids know that we care about them yeah. and what they do in their future. Yeah. And that they'll come out the other end in good shape. Yeah. And, you know, we've had, uh, between here and in New York, uh, we've had better than 75,000 kids come through our oh, program. And, and we know it works and we're very proud of the work we do. Can I ask you a baseball question? Sure. Um, I don't you, know if I can answer that one, but I'll you, give it a you, shot. You manage a team that really was at the height, I think, of baseball popularity. Uh, the Yankees were glamorous, popular. Now we, we keep hearing about all these things baseball is doing to try to make baseball more palatable to what is known as the millennials. Right. We, uh, Brandon Belt just had this 21 bat, <laughs> and everyone went crazy as if he did it on purpose. <clears throat> do you think baseball needs to think in that way? What can we do to change it? Do you think this is just cyclical, that people will find the beauty in baseball? Well, I, I'd like to think it's cyclical, but yeah. we can't sit back and, and uh, assume it's going to be that way. Yeah. <clears throat> I think we've got it. Uh, you know, you say the millennials who, you know, uh, they they want to be entertained. Right. And and we need to be more personal with our sport. Yes. We need to let them uh, know players a little bit more intimate yes. than, than maybe in the past when they see you at a distance and they know your number and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, Tony Petiti, who's our uh, 
uh, deputy commissioner and yeah. he's with CBS and, and all the networks, right. you know, he's certainly work working toward that goal. But yeah. It's a little different for me being an old codger and, and not wanting to make any changes, but yeah. you have to understand that, right. uh, you know, I know when David Wells is going to be here tonight, wanted to listen to rock music, you know, hard rock when uh, he was pitching, I, I realized that if it's going to help him, I got to let it go. <laughs> Right, so exactly. so you, you sort of have to be understanding of, of what is interesting people right. and, and try to accommodate them without without disrupting our game. Right, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you.